What's going on everybody? My name is Alexander Ayling and welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm gonna be sharing with you the essential information that you need to know before you visit New Zealand. This travel guide is gonna be jam-packed with facts and tips and all the info that you really should know before you visit this beautiful country. So don't go anywhere. Also, if you're new here, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any upcoming content. If you enjoy the video, give it a thumbs up and drop your own tips down there in the comment section. I really love facilitating conversation down there. That's what this is all about. It's not a one-way chat if you add your voice down there in the comment section and answer each other's questions as well. I love seeing this community, sharing tips with each other and making sure that we all have the best time when we visit this beautiful country. So without further ado, let's get into the video. lies in the South Pacific Ocean, about 1,600 kilometers or 990 miles from Australia and roughly 1,000 kilometers, 600 miles south of the Pacific Island areas of New Caledonia, Fiji, and Tonga. New Zealand is made up of three main islands, the North, the South, and Stewart Island below the South Island, as well as 600 other smaller islands. New Zealand's capital city is located at the southern tip of the North Island while its most populous city, Auckland, is located in the northern section of the North Island. Because New Zealand is located in the Southern Hemisphere, the further south you go, the colder the climate gets. The further north you go, the warmer it gets. With that information in mind, it makes sense that 77% of New Zealand's population live on the North Island, even though the North Island is not actually called the mainland. It's the smaller of the islands. The South Island is much larger than the North Island is, while the North Island is much more populated than the South Island. The North Island is known as Teika a Maui in the Maori language, the local indigenous culture here in New Zealand, while the South Island is known as Te Waka a Maui, Maui's canoe, or Te Waipunamu. The South Island is often referred to as the mainland here in New Zealand because it's 32% bigger than the North Island. With a Total land area approximately 104,000 square miles or 270,000 square kilometers, it's roughly the size of Japan or the state of California, and it's slightly bigger than Great Britain. Speaking of Great Britain, New Zealand was once a colony of Great Britain, but before that, the Maori Islanders arrived here probably around the year AD 1200. They arrived in ocean-going canoes known as wakas, and they most likely came from the nearby islands of Tahiti. The population of New Zealand is just over 5 million people, while the country has over 40 million sheep. So yes, pretty much everywhere you go in New Zealand, outside of the national parks, you're gonna see a lot of sheep, you're also gonna see a lot of cattle. That's because this country is predominantly agricultural and rural. Even though it doesn't really feel like it when you're traveling around New Zealand, it is a predominantly urban country with over 73% of the population living in urban areas and over one quarter of them living in the city of Auckland. New Zealanders also enjoy one of the highest life expectancies in the world, 82.3 years for females and 78.3 years for males. And the time zone is New Zealand time, which is GMT plus 12. Okay, so we've gotten a lay of the land, but let's talk about the climate. New Zealand has a fascinating, diverse climate, stretching from subtropical almost tropical feeling up in the far north of the North Island to downright frigid right down there at the bottom of the South Island. It's got snow-capped mountains, there's skiing and snowboarding, but there's also beautiful beaches with warm water, snorkeling, swimming, surfing, you name it. Being an island country, most of the country lies very close to the coast. Close to the coast, close to the coast. Being close to the coast means mild winters, but mild, also is a mild understatement. We just spent our first winter here and it was the wettest winter on record. It wasn't particularly cold, but it was very wet. And that explains why New Zealand is such a green country because it receives a lot of rainfall. And New Zealand doesn't really have any deserts, although there is a desert-like area in the central plateau of the North Island near the main volcanoes. What about weather and when to come? 
Well, if you're planning a visit to New Zealand, I highly recommend you visit in New Zealand's summer months, which are from December until March. That's when you have the highest chance of having great weather. There's nothing quite like a New Zealand summer. It's just blissfully beautiful down here. And what's nice about it is that you could probably swing it with your winter vacation, your Christmas holidays. You can come down here during that period of time, get away from the cold weather in the Northern Hemisphere and enjoy some Kiwi summer. Autumn is from March until May but you can get some great weather right up until the end of March, beginning of April. Winter is June, July, August, but sometimes it feels like September, still kind of winter, and even October, at least this year. But spring technically is September, October, November, and then you're right back at summer, December, January, February, and March. If you're planning on coming and going snowboarding in the South Island, in Queenstown, or in Wanaka, or in Christchurch area, then you're probably gonna wanna visit during the winter time, which is June, July, and August. That's when you have the most snow and the best conditions for any of those snow sports. What about language? What languages are spoken here in New Zealand? Well, there are actually three recognized official languages in New Zealand. You have English, you have Maori, and you have New Zealand Sign Language. So planning your trip, the high season for tourism is that December through February time. That's the height of summer, it's when the weather is the best, but you also have to deal with the most crowds. And certain areas of New Zealand can become very, very crowded, especially now that the borders are back open and tourism is starting to ramp back up after. It is worth noting though that during the summer months, accommodation prices do rise. I would recommend you visit in the shoulder season. So how much does it cost to visit New Zealand? Well, first and foremost, New Zealand is located right down at the bottom of the Southern Hemisphere. It's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So first and foremost, airfare is fairly expensive. Chances are you'll probably be flying with New Zealand's national carrier, Air New Zealand, which does a great job, but they also have fairly high prices. You can find flash sales, so I would recommend going and getting on their mailing list because all of a sudden, out of the blue, you might get an email with way more affordable airfare, which you can book in advance. Also using any of those flight aggregator sites like Skyscanner might help get you a better rate than just booking straight through the airline. Another pro tip is when you're looking for your airfare, browse in private mode. Why? Because airlines are tracking your interest. They're tracking when you're looking to fly and where you're looking to go. And if you exit out of that browser window and you come back, they're gonna bump those prices up because they know you're interested. So browse in private mode, and then you can compare and contrast without worrying about the price going up. New Zealand has its own currency, the New Zealand dollar. Right now, at the time of filming, one US dollar is worth one New Zealand dollar and 63 cents. New Zealand is not necessarily an affordable country to visit. Prices are more expensive. Prices for food, prices for petrol, all because New Zealand lies down at the bottom of the world and they have to ship a lot of these commodities into the country and those shipping costs are then passed on to the consumer. So if you're on a tight budget, do what you can to save money when you're here. Hire a camper van and sleep in a van. That way you have a rental car and you're saving money on accommodation. Cook your own food, go to grocery stores. Pack and save is a more affordable option than maybe some of the other grocery stores. Do the things that you can to save money while you're here because New Zealand is not really a super budget friendly option. It's more of like a bucket list travel destination. All major credit cards are accepted in New Zealand, although many places will pass the surcharge, usually about 2% onto the consumer. So if you're gonna use a credit card, they might make you pay 2% more. What they use a lot instead is called an F-Post card, and it's essentially a bank card that functions as a credit card. It's got, you know, like just a touch and pay function. Personally, as a traveler, I love using my travel credit cards, which are linked to mileage accounts with airlines so that I earn miles from my purchases, which can then go towards buying airfare in the future. So I personally still think it's worth it 
to use a credit card, even if it's a 2% surcharge more, because I know I'm getting my airline miles. But a pro tip is to make sure that you know what your credit card pin is before you come and visit, because a lot of places will make you use your pin, especially like getting gasoline, getting petrol, as they call it here. Um, you have to have a pin for your credit card in order to be able to use it. So make sure you know what your pin is. And also if you're traveling here from abroad, call your credit card company beforehand, call your bank beforehand, let them know that you'll be traveling to New Zealand because if you don't, they might just think, uh-oh, there's a charge coming up from New Zealand and you live in North America or Europe, this is probably fraudulent and then they'll freeze your card and you could be in the middle of nowhere and not have great cell service. So avoid any of those little issues by calling ahead, letting your credit card, letting your bank know that you're gonna be traveling to New Zealand before you travel to New Zealand. And let's just talk about bargaining. A lot of places that you go, whether it's in Southeast Asia or in Latin America or in Africa, uh, you can haggle a little bit. Right? New Zealand's not really one of those places. The price that is offered is usually the price that they'll sell it for. The only place where you might have a little bit of room for haggling is an op shop or a thrift store. So how do you get to New Zealand? Well, you're not gonna swim, that's for sure. You're probably gonna arrive via airplane and the main airport is located in Auckland. There are a lot of different carriers that can bring you here depending on where you're traveling from. The main national carrier is Air New Zealand. From Auckland, you'll be able to get flights to various other domestic airports. Most of those flights are gonna be either operated on Air New Zealand or Jetstar. A couple of other airlines that offer flights to New Zealand are United, Emirates, Air China, Jetstar, uh, who else? Virgin, Virgin Atlantic. LAN, Qantas, and Virgin Australia. If you're sailing here, then you've probably already researched all of that. You can arrive by boat here, but there aren't any international ferries or terminals. Cruise ships do come to New Zealand, um, but I have never taken one, so I can't really advise you there. The one thing I can say is that you're probably gonna be jet lagged when you arrive to New Zealand. Let's talk about visa requirements. Citizens of over 60 countries, including the US and all EU countries, do not require a visa to travel New Zealand as long as that trip is less than three months. Visitors from the UK can stay up to six months without a visa, but they will need to prove that they have the right to live in the UK. In both cases, you must have a exit ticket from New Zealand and be able to provide that you have enough money for your trip to New Zealand. Eligible travelers who are interested in short-term employment to supplement their income can apply for New Zealand's working holiday schemes. Under this program, citizens from over 44 different countries aged 18 to 35 can apply for a working holiday visa. Those countries include the USA, Canada, the UK, Brazil, Mexico, Germany, the Netherlands, Peru, the list goes on and on, so check that out and see if you are eligible for a working holiday visa. Little privacy alert though, back in 2018, New Zealand passed a law which can charge a fine of up to $5,000 New Zealand to anyone who refuses to hand over passwords for their mobile device or accounts um, at the border. So when you travel, there is the odd case that you may be asked to hand over your device to a customs or border protection official. And if you fail to do so, New Zealand can fine you. I've never heard of this happening to anyone, but it is something to be aware of. So maybe it's time to delete all of your risque photos in your photo album before you come. Just saying, probably a good idea regardless. All right, let's talk about clothing and what to pack. New Zealand is a fairly laid back country when it comes to the dress code. Most people walk around in the supermarket in their pajamas with no shoes on, or they wear gum boots pretty much everywhere. So it's not like you're gonna get looked down on for not dressing up. The key though with New Zealand is comfort and compatibility because the climate is so versatile and changes so often. And the key to being prepared for that is layering. 
It's very normal here in New Zealand to get four seasons in a day. So you do wanna be prepared when you're out and about that you have the right clothing for this inclement weather that is just so common here in New Zealand. Even if you're visiting in the middle of summer, once the sun goes down, the temperature will drop. I can tell you, first summer here was out in shorts and a t-shirt, went to a nice little bar to watch the sunset by the lake, and then once the sun went down, wind picked up, it was freezing, and my teeth were chattering before I knew it. So make sure you have a sweater or a jumper, as it's called here, handy, because once the sun goes down, the temperature goes with it. I'd also recommend bringing sturdy footwear. A pair of trail runners or some light hiking boots, as well as a pair of flip-flops or jandals, as they're called here, would be a nice combination. And then if you just have some casual shoes that you would wear, maybe if you go out to a nice restaurant or if you're walking around in the city, that would do just fine. Make sure you bring a rain jacket. One of those little stuffable ones will do just fine if it's the summertime, something a little sturdier if it's in the winter. Swimwear and a quick dry towel. I always have a quick dry towel and a pair of swim trunks or togs as they're known here in New Zealand in my car because there are just rivers and lakes and beaches everywhere and you never know when you're going to want to just pull over, dive in for a quick swim. Having the option and the clothing to get wet and then dry back off is always a good call. Another thing to make sure you bring is insect repellent. I say New Zealand is paradise on earth except for one thing. And that one thing is the sand fly. The sand fly is a demonic creature created in the depths of hell. It's so small, nearly microscopic, but when it lands, it packs a punch like Mike Tyson. It hurts. It's gonna turn into a welt, it's gonna itch. It is literally the worst thing about New Zealand, but that's pretty much it. There are no bears, there's no mountain lions, there's no giant mammal predators, and yeah, there's no snakes, there's no poisonous reptiles. New Zealand is a ridiculously safe place in that sense, with like animals and stuff, except for the sand fly. And there are also mosquitoes here too, so especially in the summer. So it's worthwhile bringing insect repellent. Bring a lot of it, layer it on, you'll be fine. And then lastly, your passport. Make sure you bring it because you will get carded if you want a drink. New Zealand's drinking age is 18. I find it nowadays in my mid 30s, it's a compliment to be carded, um, but they do that very often. And if you don't have your passport on you, you will not be able to be served. Even if you have a foreign driver's license, it's not legit to get a beer or a glass of wine or a cocktail. So if you're planning on drinking, make sure you bring your passport. And then lastly, a good pair of sunglasses because the sun is strong down here, which also means you should bring sunscreen, a good strong sunscreen. So protect your skin with sunscreen, protect your eyes with a good pair of polarized sunglasses. How about charging your devices? Voltage, let's talk electricity, friends. Electricity is supplied at 230 to 240 volts. If you're coming from the United States of America, you're gonna need an adapter that looks like this because that is what the prong looks like down here in New Zealand. It's got one here, two there at an angle, so you can just plug in your US thing there and then plug that into the wall. Let's talk about getting around. New Zealand is not the best country in terms of public transport. First and foremost, buses and trains. If you're in any of New Zealand's major cities, then there are a lot of public transport options, mostly buses, the occasional commuter train as well. But when you get outside of the main cities, that's when it becomes very apparent that you're gonna need a rental car or a van or some other form of transport. Most cities have some late night bus options for boozy Friday and Saturday nights, but they're infrequent, so don't rely on those. Major cities do have Uber or taxi services, but once you get outside of those major cities, 
Don't expect to be able to just open your phone and get an Uber at one o'clock in the morning. It's probably not gonna happen. Main cities have plenty of taxis and those taxis are usually metered and reliable. The smaller the town, the fewer the taxis, the higher the prices. If you're gonna be driving in New Zealand, one important thing to remember is that you need to drive on the left-hand side of the road. If you're watching this video and you're not from the UK, then you're probably used to driving on the right-hand side of the road on the left-hand side of the vehicle. Being a member of the UK Commonwealth means that we also have the UK side of driving, which is the left-hand side of the road on the right-hand side of the vehicle. So something to keep in mind, stay left, okay? Don't drive on the right-hand side of the road. You'll get into a head-on collision. If you are looking to rent a car, all of the major international car rental companies like Avis and Hertz and Budget, they all do operate here in New Zealand, but there are also plenty of local car rental agencies or van rental agencies that also offer good deals. Let's talk cultural context, cliches, history, and fun fact. The history of New Zealand stretches back at least 700 years ago when Polynesian settlers arrived from other islands in the Pacific and founded strong Maori culture here with links and connections to the land and the sea. The Maori culture is still very strong here in New Zealand, and a lot of the place names are in Te Reo Maori, or the Maori language. Chances are you'll hear somebody say kia ora, which means hello, it also means see you later in Maori. The first European explorer to sight New Zealand was the Dutch navigator Abel Tasman on the 13th of December, 1642. If you're planning to visit New Zealand and you make it to the northern tip of the South Island, visit the Abel Tasman National Park. It's one of the most beautiful corners of the country. Because of its remote location in the South Pacific, New Zealand was one of the last land masses to be colonized by human beings in the world. When it broke off of the main continent of Gondwana land, New Zealand was geographically isolated for over 80 million years, which allowed for some unique evolutions to occur here with the animals and the plants that call New Zealand home. Only 5% of New Zealand's population is human. The rest are all animals. There are no native species of snakes in New Zealand, but there are a few native species of lizards, geckos primarily. The country's national bird is the kiwi bird, a flightless nocturnal bird, which is why New Zealanders are known as kiwis. It has nothing to do with the fruit, the kiwi fruit, which also grows here and is absolutely delicious. But the kiwi fruit is actually native to Asia. A couple of fun, quirky little facts here. The film trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, brought over $200 million into the New Zealand economy. And the government of New Zealand has the only worldwide right to print and mint commemorative coins for The Lord of the Rings. Chronicles of Narnia were also shot in New Zealand as well as the new Amazon series, Rings of Power. New Zealand is also the first place in the world to see the sun every single day. The city of Gisborne on the east coast of the North Island is the first place in the world to greet the sunrise. So if you're a morning person, head to Gisborne. It's absolutely beautiful over there. Great weather, great surf, and you'll get to see the first sunrise every single day. Let's talk about food and drink. The three most popular dishes in New Zealand are, number one, the Maori hangi. So the hangi is essentially a pit oven. It's a slow cooking method where volcanic rocks are heated to very high temperatures and then a pit is dug. It's lined with different like palm fronds or plants and then the food is placed in the oven, the hot rocks are placed on top of it, and then it's all buried. And that will cook for six, eight hours, and then you open it all up, everything's cooked, it's delicious, and it's definitely a unique bucket list experience if you've never tried it before. That is saved for special occasions here because it is a big, undertaking, it's a long time to cook. Number two is the Kiwi Burger. It's a grass-fed beef burger with aged cheddar, topped with fresh 
romaine lettuce, tomato, and then the defining ingredient, which is a thinly sliced piece of beetroot and a fried egg. McDonald's known as Macca's here has released this Kiwi burger since 1991, and it's become a fan favorite of New Zealanders all over the country. And then number three, Hokey Pokey ice cream. It's the best. I can't believe it doesn't exist outside of New Zealand. It's just a delicious flavor. And my wife, literally, she's like always asking me to pull over at a dairy so that she can have a scoop of Hokey Pokey ice cream. So if you're visiting, make sure you try out some Hokey Pokey ice cream. What about the water? Well, New Zealand tap water is super clean, it's safe to drink, and it's accessible all over the country. Also, many of the national parks, especially in the South Island and Fiordland, you can just drink straight from the creeks. New Zealand is also world famous for its wine. Grapes grow very well here in the diverse climates around New Zealand, and it's Pinot Noir, as well as it's Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc have become world famous. Craft beer has become a thing. There are tons of craft breweries all over the country, and their hazy pale ales or hazy India pale ales have become extremely popular. So if you like a craft beer, make sure you check out the hazy IPA. If a boozy beverage is not your thing of choice, make sure you check out an LP, Lemon and Pairoa, which is New Zealand's own soft drink. It's very unique, but it's also really tasty. I'm a fan. One other classic kiwi snack that you have to try when you visit is a meat pie. Yes, I know, meat and pie, what? If you're from you know, North America, then you probably think of like apple pie and pies that are sweet, berry pies. Well, in New Zealand, pies are savory most of the time, okay? And meat pies are like the perfect little snack. They're available in petrol stations or in bakeries or cafes and they're hearty and delicious and a mince meat pie or a mince and cheese pie is an absolute must. Gotta try it. If you're vegan or vegetarian, they also have some other options, but if you're not, make sure you try a mince meat pie. One other kiwi food that you have to try when you come visit is Marmite. Okay, this is one of those yeast spreads. It's high in vitamin B12. You don't just put a spoon into this and eat it straight. That would be like trying to eat an old dirty gym sock. But when you spread it onto a piece of toast, you put a poached egg or something on top of it, some scrambled eggs on toast with a little scrape of Marmite, that is really, really good. Marmite is New Zealand's version of Vegemite, which is Australia's version of Marmite. And these two are in a giant battle. You tell me which one you like more. Vegemite or Marmite? Let's talk about social etiquette, the do's and the don'ts of visiting New Zealand. Do, be mindful of Maori culture. Pay respect to the Maori heritage and culture here in New Zealand. And also be mindful of the history. It's much like the history of Native Americans in the United States. Number two, buy local. There are tons of great local New Zealand businesses who are offering quality products and really could use your support. One of the best things you can do when you're traveling is to support local industry, support local creators and makers. So do that. When you travel around, ask and search for local products and buy local whenever you can. And then number three, learn some te reo Maori, some Maori language. Some Maori words are used on a daily basis here in New Zealand. First off, New Zealand is known as Aotearoa in Maori. Kia ora means hello. Fanao means family. Fare means house. And kai means food. And you probably already know this one. Moana means ocean. So seafood, kai moana. A little bit of effort goes a long way. Okay, let's talk about the don'ts. Number one, don't mistake New Zealand for Australia. People, come on. These are two different countries. There's a thousand miles of ocean between them. And yes, 
Maybe sometimes if you haven't heard accents from New Zealand, you might confuse an Australian accent with a New Zealand one or vice versa, but they are not the same country. And if you know what you're listening for, the accents sound very different. But my dad, who's from New Zealand and has lived in the United States for the last 30 years, is constantly mistaken for an Australian. There is a friendly rivalry between Australia and New Zealand. Most of the time it's friendly, unless it is a rugby game. Then when the All Blacks, New Zealand's national rugby team, the best rugby team in the world, goes up against the Wallabies, Australia's national team, that friendly rivalry becomes a real rivalry. Don't under budget. There are a lot of bucket list life activities here in New Zealand and you may want to save and splurge for those. What about where to visit? Here I'm just gonna leave you with a link to my 12 essential bucket list travel destinations for New Zealand. I have another video on my channel where I share an in-depth guide for the 12 places I think should be at the top of your bucket list for New Zealand. There's a lot more than 12 though. So start off by checking out that video. Remember, if you're not already subscribed to my channel, hit subscribe because I'm gonna be doing a follow-up to that video with 12 more places that should be on your New Zealand bucket list. But in the meantime, and in this video, check out my other video after this one is done where I share with you my 12 essential New Zealand bucket list travel destinations. All right, friends, well, I hope that this video has helped you prepare, giving you some interesting and useful information to help you get ready for your trip to New Zealand. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you're not subscribed yet, let's change that. Click the subscribe button, turn on notifications so you don't miss out on any of my upcoming videos. And if you have any tips of your own, please share them down in the comment section. Okay, catch you in the next video. Peace.